Our panelists will do this. Vince, what are they? Our panelists, please join us on the front, please. Nope, wherever you want. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Mariah Brown. I am the Strategic Partnerships Manager here at Action Network slash Action Builder. Thank you all for joining us for our second Build Power event. So please give a round of applause to yourselves for coming out. Our Build Power events are highlighting organizing in the US right now. Um, we have some amazing panelists that we would like to introduce you to. This event is made for you all to organize, get to know each other, hear some real stories, um, and inspire change. Uh, so I would like to introduce first our co-founder and executive director, Brian Young, uh, and then he'll kick us off after that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mariah. And again, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, just I'll be very brief because I'm the last person that most of you want to talk to. And if you want to talk to me, I'm around if you're one of the few that do. Um, but it, just a quick thing about what these events are and who we are. Um, you know, a lot of people know the Action Network tool and Action Builder tool, and we build technology. But we build technology in cooperation with the people using it and with the movement. Uh, we're always nonprofit. And the idea is that the technology is just a tool. It's a means to an end. And the technology is not enough. Um, that is why we built collectively with people using the tools, because the programs and the technology is when real power gets built. Um, so building power is what this event is about. And the technology makes certain things possible, but they don't make them happen. Um, and we're here today to talk about making things happen. So we have some great panelists coming up that will get introduced in a moment. Um, Again, thanks to Mariah for emceeing and Martha Grant around here for putting all this together. Um, and thanks to uh, the People's Forum for hosting us here today. Um, and I said I'd be brief, and I'm looking for my friend Chris. Uh, he is going to be out here a second. So I'm going to keep talking just a little bit more. Um, so uh, just a little bit of history about Action Builder. We started out with Action Network. The first thing Action Network was ever used for and built for was actually the Black Friday strikes and protests against Walmart, if everyone remembers that. You know, the day of action where you can adopt an event and a thing that we all do as a movement now. That was sort of the beginning of that. And we built that with the people working on the campaign. They were trying to think, what can we do on Black Friday that can really give workers and their supporters a chance to rally together in a way that they owned their event instead of all just subsuming themselves to sort of this big sort of collective. So we built um, that tool, you know, really partnered a lot with unions and others to extend uh, the technology, but always with that core in mind of local power being built by the people locally. Um, people were using the tool Action Network to organize and having a bad experience because it's not an organizing tool, it's a mobilization tool. And technology does what it does and it doesn't do other things. So we partnered with AFL-CIO, a little bit with People's Action to really build Action Builder as an organizing tool. You know, mobilization is a lot about reach, a lot about acti activating people, but leadership development, really fostering trusting relationships within communities. The core of organizing is what Action Builder was built for, and as we're rolling it out, just continuing to have events like this to get people together, to talk about organizing, to build the capacity of all of us around organizing throughout the movement. So we're here, we did a small event in DC about a month ago, in a couple of months we'll be in Atlanta, and we're just trying to build up organizing in any way we can. So again, thank you. I see my friend Chris is out now. See ya. And he is next, so I'll turn it over. Needs no introduction. Chris Smalls, founder of Amazon Labor Union. Just here from London. What's up, everybody? Uh, thank you all for having me. I'm sorry I'm a little lethargic. I just, I'm in a different time zone, but I'm here now, and I'm happy to see a lot of familiar faces, especially people that's fighting a good fight. You know, so this is always good to come to this space because we know this space is welcoming, and we know this space uh, brings a lot of energy. And actually, right before our election, uh, we we had an event here. I was our, actually our first our first fundraiser for the ALU. So to have this surreal moment of being back up here with like-minded folks and people that is in the good battle with us, 
um, is amazing. So thank you for the support that we had from the beginning. And um, y'all know this is a marathon. This is a, it's not a sprint. It's going to be a long fight. And we all got to stay committed to the fight. And I know everybody in this room is committed to the long haul. So solidarity forever. Solidarity forever, man. With that being said, we know solidarity is shared and expressed in different ways. But one thing about solidarity is showing up for one another and also expressing that solidarity doesn't mean when you don't agree with somebody, you leave the fight, or you jump ship, or you stab somebody in the back, or you don't want to uh, organize anymore. Understand that solidarity means that you're going to have to organize with people that may not have the same ideology of you, may not like the same politics, may not look alike, may not come from the same background, the same cloth. But understand when you're talking about bringing people together, there's only one enemy here. We know who that enemy is, right? It's the 1% class. Jeff Bezos is definitely one, but there's a whole bunch of them. It's a whole bunch of them. And I can name all our CEOs. We know who they are. But they're not the only ones. There's a system in place that's been in there from the beginning of time. And that system is not built for us. And when I'm talking about us, I'm talking about workers and the working class. And we've seen in this country for decades how unions and organized labor has been attacked. And we don't have that money to counter that. We're talking about companies that make trillions of dollars, are worth trillions of dollars, and make billions of dollars a day off of our labor. So the only thing we can do, because really we're the rich ones, is withhold our labor. Because really, Jeff Bezos can't come to the package, I mean, the warehouse, and, and pack a box. <laughs> Howard Schultz is not making no good coffee, I can tell you that. <laughs> so understand who really has the power, who really is valuable. And we haven't been getting what we've been paid, our wages, our quality of life. We've seen that in the pandemic. We've seen what this government has been doing. We still continue to see that. And when I left the White House, we saw what happened. Joe Biden gave $10 billion to Amazon. And everybody was like, well, Chris, why did you go to the White House to shake his hand? I'm like, I wasn't the only one there. I know there was a lot of attention on me. But guess what? We all should be upset, because guess what? That was taxpayer dollars. That was everybody's money, not just ours. So understand that this fight is bigger than us. It's about the community. And this starts at home, the conversation that we have with our family members, our loved ones, our neighbors, let them know what they do when they support these companies. Tell them to stand in solidarity until they do better by us. So understand that this fight is bigger than us. It's about our future. And the younger generation is definitely the lead. And what I mean by that, is that this organizing that you have been seeing for the last year is unprecedented. You've never seen it before. It's different, it's unique, it's new school, but it's necessary. When you're talking about the 21st century and these tech companies, it's a different monster, it's a different animal. And once again, we don't have the money to defeat that. But we do got one thing, and that's people's power. Because when we fight back, we win. 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 And if we don't get it, 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 shut it down. Every damn time, remind them who has the power, and remind them why y'all in this fight. We're here for the long haul, y'all. There's gonna be dark days. Gonna be days of defeat. Gonna be days of doubt. Gonna be days when nobody wanna talk to you, days when nobody signed the card. But be there. Be there for that worker when management is getting on their ass. Because I promise you, it's gonna be a powerful conversation. So thank you for having me. Let's keep up the good fight. I stand with you guys. I got your back. I know you guys got ours. 
Solidarity forever, y'all. Power to the people. Well, I don't really have much to say after that. Thank you so much. Please get up for Chris Smalls again and our, our executive director, Brian Young. So I would just like to give a brief bio of our host for this evening, this evening Max Alvarez. Uh, Max is the editor-in-chief of the Real News Network. He's also the host of the Working People podcast, which this will also be featured on, and the author of the new book, The Work of the Living, Working People Talk About Their Lives in the Year the World Broke. So please give it up for Max and the rest of our panelists. Hell yeah. So who's fired up after that? That's what I'm talking about. Um, thank you so much, Mariah. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, everyone at Action Builder. Thank you, everyone at the People's Forum. Absolutely love this space. Please support them however you can. Thank you to uh, Chris Smalls for uh, jetting his ass in from London and doing this. We appreciate it. Our girl, Michelle Valentin Yeves from the ALU is here, too. Let's give it up for the ALU one more time. Yeah. Woo! So uh, as Mariah said, we are going to be recording this as a Working People live show. So just a disclaimer uh, to everyone, that will include the Q&A. Uh, you don't have to speak if you don't want to. You can always come up to us afterwards if, that, if you're more comfortable with that. Um, but loving the energy so far, so let's uh, yeah, let's keep that going. And I'm going to start like with a, a little introduction in a sec, but just wanted to uh, keep the energy going and let y'all know uh, a little bit about our incredible panel. Uh, we got my man Vince from Home Depot Workers United in Philly. Let's give it up for Vince. We got Toff from Labor's Local 79 here in New York City. Give it up for Toff. We got Sarah Beth from Trader Joe's United out in Minnesota. Let's give it up. And we got Riley from Starbucks Workers United from my hometown in Baltimore. Thank you, Riley. So they're going to introduce themselves to y'all in a second. Um, and I think we are all set to go. I uh, just wanted to finally ask if you could please silence your cell phones if you haven't already. Uh, again, we are recording this. So... Uh, with all that in mind, let's get to the good stuff. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, to this special live show of Working People, a podcast about the lives, jobs, dreams, and struggles of the working class today, brought to you in partnership with In These Times Magazine and The Real News Network, produced by Jules Taylor, and made possible by the support of listeners like you. So I am truly honored to be here with all of you at the People's Forum here in New York. Absolutely love the People's Forum, incredible place. Uh, Y'all should come here, support their work. And we are here in collaboration with our friends at Action Builder and the Action Network for our second live show. Listeners may remember that we hosted our first live show together with the folks at Action Builder at Busboys and Poets in Washington, D.C. back in December where I got to talk with Michelle and Harry Marino. Uh, so Michelle from the Amazon Labor Union, Harry Marino from the minor league baseball players. It was an incredible conversation that we got to have about two incredible organizing victories that we witnessed last year. And you know, we want to keep these conversations going. We wanna bring folks together who are fighting that fight, who are carrying on the struggle in different workplaces, different industries, different states you know, all across the country and even beyond. Like we said, Chris was in the UK. UK is popping off right now, right? I mean, like there are the RMT uh, rail workers on strike. The NHS healthcare workers are on strike. Higher ed workers are on strike. Ambulance drivers are on strike. France is shutting down right now as workers take to the streets uh, to, to fight against Emmanuel Macron's neoliberal bullshit and they're taking over of the country's beloved pension system. So workers everywhere are fighting the good fight, and we need to join that struggle however we can and support anyone who is fighting that fight. Every little bit helps, even if you're just showing up to a picket line or you know donating to a strike fund. I was just down uh, in Tribeca earlier today walking the picket line with the New York Legal Assistant Group workers uh, they are a local of the UAW. They've been on strike for the past two days. Shout out to New York LAG. Um, please support them however you can. 
uh, spread the word about that. Um, but I think, as Chris said, right, you know, the, the really exciting thing about this moment, even though we know that the bosses, the 1%, the ruling class, the order givers in our society, you know, they're coming out of COVID-19 feeling like they're the victims, feeling like they have to take back what was stolen from them by having to give workers PPE, right, if they even did that, right, or, or claiming that no one wants to work anymore because our government did the bare minimum of providing people with necessary assistance to survive a world-shattering pandemic. Now the bosses are out there complaining that, you know, that has made us lazy and we don't want to work. And so they're really striking back. But I think what's exciting is that the reinforcements are coming and the people on this panel are living proof of that, right? You, the fire is burning all across this country and we have it within ourselves to keep that fire burning. And so that's what we're here to do today. So um, normally on the show, I get to have one-on-one -on -one sit down interviews with workers. We talk in depth about their lives, their jobs, their dreams, their struggles. In these live shows, we're really you know, gonna focus in on the organizing side of people's stories, right? To give y'all more access to the folks on the front lines fighting that fight to learn about them, their coworkers, how they're doing it, what they're learning from their you know, setbacks and failures and defeats, how we can replicate and build on their successes, how each of these struggles at Starbucks, Home Depot, in the construction industry, right, Trader Joe's, how we can all learn from each other and how we can better come together as a labor movement to support one another, right? So that's what we're really here to do. And so with all that in mind, I'm gonna shut up and I'm gonna go around and ask our amazing panelists just to Start off by quickly introducing yourself to the good audience, the good listeners, the good viewers, and then we'll talk about some organizing. So Vince, you're up first. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Um, my name is Vince Kielas. I am, uh, well, I was a Home Depot employee, just got fired today. Um, Boo! Yeah, yeah. No, it's all good, though. It's all good. That The, the fight just evolves. Um, you know, uh, lead organizer down, down in Philly. Um, I guess also the interim president for Home Depot Workers United, the more national movement. Um, and just really, really, really great experience. Um, it's really awesome to be here, you know, inspired by some of the people, you know, Michelle, Chris, um, as well as people from Starbucks, um, Workers United. Very, very inspired by that. Um, and what I would say, you know, looking, looking at our campaign, there's definitely a lot that I wanna to speak tonight about and where, what, you know, we learned from, from how things went down um, where we fell short, but also to where to be inspired to continue fighting. Because, you know, I can at least say on the Home Depot front, like, look, they spend tens of millions of dollars trying to indoctrinate people to not vote for a union. And literally, you know, a handful of people with chips on their shoulder, just going and talking shit every day, talking to people and, and just getting them riled up. We spent zero dollars on our campaign and we had the first union election at a Home Depot store ever. You know, shout out to the guys over in San Jose, the drivers that, that got their union election, but that wasn't a store. Um, and you know, just just with that desire, with that passion, we were able to achieve as much as we were. And so it's it's really exciting to be in a room with people that kind of match that energy that helped to push that, you know, to be with other people fighting that good fight and you know, just saying, hey, let's let's keep it going, let's keep banging. That's what we're here for. We want all that smoke. Hell yeah. <laughs> So hello everybody, uh, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Tafidar, you can call me Taf, and I am representing Labor's Local 79. So if um, you're looking up here and you're thinking one thing is not like the others, <laughs> it's not just because I have my laptop out, but it's also because um, we happen to be an established union. And um, I'm gonna be talking to you guys a little bit about what we do, but you know, when it comes to construction, deadliest industry, um, it's the cash cow for New York City, you know, whether you're talking about the revenue that the city gets, the profits that Wall Street makes, the power that Rebney has, et cetera, et cetera. It's one of the most you know, core strategic sectors of the economy. And the labor relations in it, um, that's, that's what we specialize in. We make sure that workers that are working in construction can go home at the end of the day, because it is a deadly industry, like I mentioned. We make sure that people are making good wages and benefits to be able to sustain families and therefore sustain communities. And you know the exciting thing about Local 79 is when people think about construction unions, usually the first thing that comes to mind is pale, male, and stale. But we are actually um, one of the most diverse construction unions in the country. 
We're uh, 70% black and brown. Um, we have the most uh, women of um, any construction local in New York City, I believe. Um, our members live and work in the five boroughs for the most part. And that makes us really unique, because in this city, you know, if, um, if you grew up in the city and you went to its public schools, you kind of had a couple of walks in life ahead of you. You know, you, if you had the opportunity, you could make it into college and maybe get out the hood that way and, you know, build a life for yourself, your family. Um, if not, you could work a blue collar job. You could do that with a high school degree and construction is one of those um, fields that people do that. Um, our apprenticeship program is second to none in both its quality and the street cred that we have amongst um, the people in New York City of low income communities. Um, and in between that, there's um, a horrible gray area of poverty and violence and criminalization and mass incarceration. And um, I really wanna dig into the nitty gritty of that and what my union does to uplift workers that are somewhere in between being enfranchised through union membership and being caught in the trap of um, economic racism and you know the deadly jungle that is non-union construction in New York City. So thank you again for being here. Hi guys, my name is Sarah Beth Ryther and I'm an employee organizer at the Trader Joe's in Minneapolis. Uh, and around this time last year, I would say that most of the folks that I work with in the Minneapolis store didn't know what a union was or had a very shaky idea of what a union was or what a union could offer us as a collective and could offer all of us individually. And in this past year, we have together grown uh, to win our uh, first union election. And yeah, super, super excited. <laughs> and become the second Trader Joe's in the country to do that. Uh, and we've formed a union with the Hadley, Massachusetts store and the Louisville, Kentucky store. Uh, and we are just really, really, really stoked to be organizing across the country very slowly and surely and using our strategies to learn and also to teach other folks. And I'm just so excited to be here and hear what everybody has uh, to say about uh, their campaigns and to learn more about the history of labor in general. Thanks. Hi everybody, I'm Riley. I am a organizer with Starbucks Workers United. I've been with Starbucks for about a year and a half. I helped organize my store in Baltimore. We are one of the 170 and counting um, union store, union Starbucks stores. Um, I'm currently based in Manhattan, working around the financial district with different stores, trying to get people excited about the union. I'm really excited to be here to talk about everyone's strategies and how we have achieved the amazing things that we have achieved. I want to share all of our tricks of the trade of how we organize. So thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. All right. So as you guys can see, we've got a real kick-ass panel of folks here with a lot of amazing, important stories to dig into. And, and as I said at the top, um, you know, there's so much that we're not going to be able to cover. Um, but I imagine if you're here, you've been following along with a lot of these stories. I would say you can also check out other great coverage. Uh, Vince and I have actually done a Working People episode together. Uh, so if you want to know more about his backstory, go check that out. Did a real news uh, segment um, at the beginning of this year with uh, Labor's Local 79. So you can check that out and hear more about the incredible organizing work they're doing. Same with Starbucks Workers United. I was in the room when the first Starbucks store in Maryland uh, voted to unionize the Charles Street store. Um, we all know about the incredible organizing there. And we all know about uh, Howard Schultz and the corporations like vicious, illegal union busting. So we need to know what we can do to help fight back and to support everyone here, Trader Joe's, Starbucks, Home Depot, in the construction industry, and beyond. Now, as I said, we want to kind of zero in on the organizing side of things. And so since we can't go in depth about your all's like origin stories and long backstories, I want to just focus on a key moment uh, for all of you. Because this is something Vince and I were talking about in Philly a couple weeks ago when we were doing a, a video interview for The Real News. I feel like it's the same for most of you, but for most of my life, right, when I was working low-wage jobs, 
whether that was you know warehouses, whether I was a pizza delivery guy, I was working in retail, working as a waiter. When things got bad at work, there were essentially, to my mind, and the common wisdom was there are two options. You quit or you stay and take it. I didn't know there was a secret third thing, right? You know, like it just never really occurred to me or my coworkers to stay and fight to change things, right? And I feel like when a person makes that mental shift, that is when they become an organizer, right? And I wanted to ask you guys, like, what was that moment for you, right? You know, and, and also, like, it's important to remind people, like, why people organize. Like, what were the issues, I guess, that were coming up in your own work or the conversations you were hearing with folks, the, the common um, concerns, issues with management, so on and so forth. Like, what were the things that really galvanized y'all to come together collectively? But also, yeah, take us back to that moment when you felt like you weren't going to quit, uh, you weren't going to just take it on the chin, but you were going to do something about it. Uh, so I could say, so right, so uh, in the receiving end, right, when I was a receiving supervisor, then when I stepped back to being an associate, um, I always joke around and say I was a glorified trash man. Essentially, I just threw out the store's trash throughout the entire day. Um, and I'm a person with a very active brain. I think a lot. Throwing out trash does not really occupy your mind much. Um, and so I kind of just reflected on my journey at Home Depot. Um, you know, I was very gung-ho at the time, trying to go corporate. It was the opportunity I had. You know, that was something that they were pushing me for. But the more I kind of like analyzed how the place operated, the more it just didn't really sit right with me. You know, you would hear things like, right, like, um, so for instance, we live in a, in a heavily Spanish speaking neighborhood um, and we're not paid to translate. And it used to be really, really frustrating because it's like, yo, 30 to 40 percent of your business is just straight Latinos that speak no English. You know, you have no trouble going to the people that speak Spanish, asking them to speak Spanish. But then when we say, hey, can we get a, like a raise for that? Like other industries pay for that is, oh, well, no, well, we don't we don't really have money in the budget, you know, so. You're, there's no way to really corroborate it. They share their sales plan, but they don't actually share or like how things break down. So you don't know what the profit margins are and stuff like that. Enter being groomed to you know be one of those corporate people, right? They start sitting you through, running through the PNL report and everything, and you know you see in 2020, 28.6 million dollars in profit. 2021, you know 30.1 million dollars in profit. 2022, 28.7 million dollars in profit, and you're like, wait. I'm supposed to believe that there's no money for this, you know? So I kind of like ran through my mind on these things. I used to listen to like a lot of podcasts. would listen to, you know, Max a lot with working people. I'd listen to, you know, Breaking Points with Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty. Um, hear a lot of things about, again, Starbucks campaign, hearing about the ALU, John Deere strike. And so you kind of start to set the seeds for like, hey, there is actually something that can be done. And so, you know, I'm running through, I'm like doing a bunch of investigating, looking into large shareholders and stuff. And in the particular moment, it was a conversation that I had with um, one of our associates out in our garden department. Um, it was a gentleman who'd been working in, this, in the company for about 25 years. And I remember talking to him and I'm, you know, can you believe we made this much? And can you believe that this, you know, Arthur Blank, you know, on a quarterly dividend cleared like 28 and a half million dollars, just in it, like, right? And, and in hindsight, right, it's actually kind of cruel to just complain about those things because it's like you're just agitating people, you know. And so I could tell he's kind of getting pissed. And he goes like, all right, dude, like, what are you going to do about it? And I just immediately shut up. And I was like, damn, that's a, that's a really good question. Like, what am I going to do about that? And I guess that's where, like, everything kind of, like, clicked into place. You know, again, you see these campaigns that are going on across the country and you recognize, like, look, like, what is your obstacle, right? At the end of the day, nobody knows their coworkers better than their coworkers. Surely these, you know, the executives don't. Shit, half of your managers don't. You know, some of them do. You know, I can say honestly, we did have some managers that were decent in our store, and they got no support. They got told, hey, you guys got to suck this shit up and deal with it. And so then the question becomes, all right, well, what can we do about this? And the answer became organizing. It became educating people. It became having conversations and just taking the time to give a shit about each other. Lo and behold, you know, 106 signatures later, we scared the absolute shit out of Home Depot. And, you know, they they sent out, thank you, thank you. They sent out, you know, they sent out the cavalry. They sent out, you know, all of their executives. They sent so many people. And that was just a great example, right? And that's that's in a way like you're so you're so happy to see that. Cause I would see like the victory, you know, up here in New York with, with Amazon. You again, you'd see all these Starbucks victories going on across the country. 
And like the, the moments that were so important were just those points of connection between the people. And you realize like, look, you lean into that, you can overcome a lot. Like I said, you know, Home Depot's a $300 billion company. They spend a shit ton of money. And we were able to push it to that point, just caring about each other, so. But yeah, shout shouts out to uh, shouts out to Eddie over in uh, Garden. If you would have never checked me on that and said, "What are you gonna do about it?" Uh, I don't know if I would have done anything. We're getting we're getting a little feedback, so I think we're okay. We'll just try like whoever's talking, everyone point your mics the other way. <laughs> um, and top, obviously, like this this um, different for you, but I'm I'm curious, like. Um, in that vein, like, were there, was there a moment when you felt like, like Vince, like that you wanted to commit yourself to the business of doing something about what was wrong? You know, like being an organizer, like was there something that really kind of changed for you? But also like as an established union, does like what does Local 79 say to folks, you know, uh, you know, non-union workers, you know, um, undocumented workers, um, returning citizens, like I guess, how do you guys talk to folks about why they should band together and unionize or do something about the issues at their work? Make more money when you're union. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so my journey actually um, starts a long time before I got into construction. Um, I got a friend in the crowd there that uh, when we were high school students told me um, he was involved in something and that there were pizza at the meetings. So naturally I had to be there. Um, organizer tricks, right? So I started going to these meetings, and they're about, about um, public schools and working class communities of color being shut down under Mayor Bloomberg's um, mayorship, whatever the word for that is. And the way, that, the way that it taught me to rethink my own experience as a public school student in the context of something much larger and bigger than myself and my family and my community that was happening to all of our communities of people that you know, I went to school with and grew up with and people like us in our, you know, socioeconomic status. I grew up in the Bronx. Um, it, it showed me that there was something going on. And I would learn later that the term for something like that is class struggle and oppression and exploitation. But it made me want to get involved. And the most acute thing in the beginning was um, they tried to take away our green metro cards. So if you grew up in New York City, you have a green metro card that lets you have like three rides a day to and from school. They wanted to take away that metro card. And I think that was around 2010. So um, there was a big rally. Uh, thousands of us walked out across the city from our schools. And we went to City Hall. And when I got there, you know, my friend sitting in the crowd was on the stage with these other high school students. I'm like, wow, I know that guy. So we got to talking after that. And I wanted to be involved in something like that because I saw it making a real difference. You know, they wanted to take away our means of transport, which would have had to force our families to pay thousands of dollars per child every year in transportation costs. Um, while they're trying to shut down our schools. And it, it showed the character of this war that was going on against black and brown working class communities. And I, I knew that, you know, I, I could sit home and, I don't know, play PlayStation or whatever, or I could go and be involved in something bigger than myself. And it kind of sent me on a lifelong journey. Um, years later, I would become a local 79 apprentice. Um, great money. I wanted to make money, and I wanted to be involved in a, in a union because I thought unions were cool um, before they became very cool. <laughs> And also, you know, I uh, applied around the time that Bernie Sanders was having his first um, run at the presidency, and there's that whole wave of our generation thinking that way. Um, and when I joined the union, you know, I was able to plug into things that were happening everywhere because my union is deeply committed to organizing, um, not just in job sites, but um, also in our communities that we come from for a holistic, comprehensive approach to economic justice that up uplifts the whole working class and not just, you know, workers for one company or workers at one job site or another. Um, and when I joined the union, you know, we were fighting for real affordable housing and good labor standards on housing developments in the Bronx. And, you know, I grew up my whole life hearing terms like gentrification and stuff like that and the need to fight against this stuff. But here I saw an institution that could actually do the, the other side of it, not just fight the problem, but actually propose a real solution you know, we can build the housing and we can make it affordable and we can do it with real labor standards and real local hire standards. And I was really vibing with all of that. Um, and, you know, if that wasn't good enough for me, we had a um, couple of years long battle at the Hudson Yards with uh, one of the largest developers in the world, Steve Ross. Um, so throw him right up there with Jeff Bezos and Ooh. Howard Schultz and all of them. So, you know, we were 
we, we had a picket line out there, multi-trades, and we were fighting for years. Um, but I don't really want to talk about the way that it ended. But it, that experience of seeing thousands of construction workers coming together every week and fighting and being willing to put it all on the line to fight for our livelihoods, you know, it, it made me realize, like, no, this is, this is it right here. Because we, we talk about neoliberal New York City, right? This is the neoliberal center of the world that grounds global systems of capitalism and imperialism and white supremacy and whatever else. The real estate industry in New York City is kind of one of the major anchors of that. And the entire class structure of the city was built upon a decades and decades long process that's tied into centuries long historical processes of the immiseration and disenfranchisement and just punishment and disciplining of black and brown working class communities here. And I could see that my union was really like a, a North Star in all of that, really pointing the needle in a way that we could organize our way out of this hole for not just ourselves as workers on these construction sites, but in our communities. So now, all these years later, um, my job as an organizer now for the union is to kind of bring that passion and that vision to other workers, um, not just non-union workers, but also workers in the union. But when it comes to talking to non-union workers, um, they kind of already know the problems for the most part. You know, if you're working for non-union construction employers, um, typically these are predatory employers that are trying to take advantage of uh, the most vulnerable parts of the working class, formerly incarcerated workers, immigrants, women, um, public housing residents, people generally living in poverty. And they, they hold things like your immigration status or your parole status above you coercively in order to exploit workers for cheap labor. So they're already being made to work in unsafe conditions for, you know, low wages um, and fucked up environments where, you know, the boss, I, it's not uncommon to hear stories from the non-union side where the boss says, I'm going to tell you to do whatever the hell I want you to do. And I know you can't do any differently because if you lose this job, you're going right back to prison. Um, so that's the reality. And when when we approach these workers, it's, um, you know, being a good organizer is about listening. So it's really about getting people comfortable to tell you their story and then honing in on what it is that they're facing and showing them what our union can do to stand with them in order to fight and help them, you know, build up their own fighting capacity when it comes to their employers. And the more and more that we do that, and I have a few other segments that I could get into a little later, um, it really paints this view where the problem isn't just this one worker, you know, in the mind of the worker, the problem isn't just them and their employer, but it's a structural thing affecting thousands and thousands of us that do the same work in different job sites on different construction projects facing the same conditions. Then it becomes a working class, you know, matter. And when we, or the non-union workers that we've organized into the union, you know, have become some of the greatest activists that I've met in my life. Max um, interviewed a couple of them for, who worked for one of the worst construction companies, Alba Demolition, that um, we were going out for years and we were helping organize some of their workers that were standing up against a, a bounty that the company put out to intimidate workers to stay away from filing workers' comp um, claims if they were injured on the job. They would give 5000 they said they would give $5,000 to any coworker that would step up and say that their workers' comp claims are fraudulent. So these workers stood up against that. They said, no, this is unfair. They joined our rallies, and they were retaliated against for it. Um, we stood up with these workers. Uh, they, the National Labor Board, you know, we, we took it there. They had to be hired back. They're now local 79 members. They're great activists. And as of last month, the owner of Alba was in handcuffs, arraigned for a construction kickback scheme that was now being cracked down on by the Manhattan District Attorney. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, so before I started working at Trader Joe's, I thought it was a really awesome place. Uh, it's very imaginative. You go into a store and it, it's really colorful. There's art everywhere. There are products that are very inventive and everyone is seems really happy to talk to you and to see you. I was interested in that energy. And when I started at Trader Joe's, it became clear very quickly 
that that uh, was a narrative the company has been pushing for years and years and years, and it is very, very different from the truth. And it is really interesting to hear folks' stories over a long period of time and just see and understand how different from the truth that is. Personally, there were several instances last winter, November and December, that were really, really scary. There were um, safety issues uh, with um, folks inside and outside of the store uh, that management uh, handled very poorly. And at one of those incidences, I was on workers' comp, and I remember just sitting in my living room and thinking, this is absolutely unacceptable. It is unacceptable that folks are afraid every single day when they're coming to work. And they're afraid because the people who are supposed to protect them are not doing their job. And so that led us to a lot of questions that led us to try to really together get to the source. Why are these safety issues happening? Is this local? Is it just us? Is it larger than us? Do you feel unsafe at your workplace? Do you feel good at your workplace? Every single shade and vari variation of those questions we asked over and over and over and over. And I think that it became, uh, after over the course of months, um, just a situation where we decided together that we were not going to abandon each other, that we were going to stay together and stick together, and the easy choice would have been to quit. The easy choice would have been to move to another retail job with similar pay, with maybe benefits that are slightly lower, um, and to give up. And instead, we said, we are really, really awesome together. We feel like a community. And so we want to, again, collectively ask these questions of ourselves and see if we can make a difference. And so that really led to the beginnings of our campaign. Uh, and the base of our campaign was that every single person, every individual is more important than the union and is more important than Trader Joe's. And that has meant that uh, when, we, uh, and I keep using the word community and I will continue to use the community, to, to use the word community because that is what we are trying to build. And we are trying to build it not only uh, in our store, not only in Massachusetts, but across the country with the understanding that folks who are uh, really entrenched in a community that cares for them uh, can fight the fight better because they know they know each other. They go to picnics together. They hang out after work. Um, they watch each other's kids. They know uh, when an illness happens. They know when uh, what bus route somebody rides. And all of this information uh, influences and informs uh, the really real um, changes that we're looking for in our workplace. Uh, and we'll continue to inform those changes. I started at Starbucks when I was 17 and in high school. So the only thing I knew about a union was that my parents were in one with, and they were teachers in Baltimore County and they were in their own labor union. So when uh, my now good friend and fellow organizer texted me, what are three things you wanna change about your job? I really sat back and thought, I was like, huh, I mean, I, I guess I could get paid a little more or, I would like to have a fair schedule where I'm getting scheduled consistent hours. So since then, we all, me and my coworkers, started communicating more about the issues going on in our store. And before this, I didn't even realize that these were issues that I was having because I thought that's just the way it is. You don't get these rights. You don't get these benefits. It's just you're here to do a job. You get paid minimum wage and then you go home. Um, where things really started to click for me is when we got into issues of health and safety regarding COVID. Um, I was, te I tested positive for COVID, alerted my boss, and I wasn't aware until after I tested positive that two coworkers that I'd worked closely with were already positive, and I was not made aware that I was put in that risk. So that, I, 
I just couldn't fathom that they would not tell me that I was in contact with this pan, this virus that is killing people, and they, they wouldn't tell me, and I showed up to work. So that's when it clicked that this isn't right. Starbucks and my management is not treating me like a human being. That ain't right. They right. So I, that's really where that clicked for me. Um, so since then, me and my coworkers would continue to talk and talk to people who we wouldn't see as often. And like you said, we built a community. And that's where my passion for organization came, was in that community that we built together. And I'm so grateful for being able to do that and bringing, being able to bring people together over their united concerns. Oh yeah. So thank you all so much for sharing that. I mean, like, and I, and I hope, um, one of the things that I'm hearing, which I imagine everyone else is hearing, anyone who's listening to this days, weeks, months after we're all here in New York is hearing the same thing that, um, you know, this isn't, this isn't stuff that's happening in some faraway land, right. But being done by some people that like are just wholly different from you. This is happening all around you. This is happening next door. This, these are your neighbors. These are your coworkers. These are your fellow parishioners, right? You are part of this movement. You just don't know it yet, right? I mean, because I think every one of us has a story like that that we can relate to. But again, it's that shift because we live in this society that just from birth beats into our heads that if you don't like it, your one option is to quit, right? Uh, your other options are, I don't know, be grateful, stop complaining, <laughs> stop expecting to be treated like a human being, you piece of shit, right? Like that's basically what our society has on offer. And so it's just really incredible to hear how you all, regular working people, people who, you know, like look like us, sound like us, people who have families, lives, backstories like us, made that brave step with your coworkers to say, no, there's another option, right? And I want to kind of keep that momentum going, right? Because I feel like, obviously, the term organizer, organizing, it's thrown around a lot these days. And I imagine, and I've had a lot of people tell me, right, that the term organizer, um, when they hear it, they kind of assume that it's referring to some, you know, different kind of person, someone who's not them. And mainly because they don't know what organizing actually looks like. So let's demystify that process a little bit and talk about like what organizing for you all looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Like, so what sorts of conversations do you get in? Like, I guess what sorts of like infrastructure building, right? Or, or just like, yeah, what does the work of organizing actually look like in your respective corners of the world? Um, and uh, you know, what in your experience works, you know, in doing that organizing and what doesn't like any sort of stories or, or, or tips that you can share. We'll, we'll finish off by talking about more of like the sort of lessons we can learn, but I guess let's go and start back with you, Vince. Um, I mean, like, as I stated earlier, and I feel like we've all kind of touched on it in the answers that we've given. I mean, like, look, organizing in its most core component is just talking to people, right? It's the organization of people. Um, it's, it's funny, right? Like sometimes when I like refer to myself as an organizer, cause I'm like, like going through like imposter syndrome, like, am I really an organizer? Like, it feels like this, like Max said, like this, this bigger thing, but in actuality, it's again, just having conversations. Like when I reflect on it, right. I didn't really get the idea to organize at Home Depot until the summertime. But when I look at like my history at Home Depot, the six years I worked there, like the seats were set there the whole time. Organizing is, Hey, like, how are you today? Like, how's your family doing? What are you doing this weekend? Right. It's those, it's those connections that pull you together because when I remember when everybody like ran down on the store and you have like all these corporate people and hey, how are you? How are you doing? And like I remember like everybody always coming back to receiving and being like, yo, these people are so full of shit. Like it's insane. And it's like that's what organizing ultimately gets to is just it's having conversations every day, talking to people. And then, you know, right again, shouts out to Eddie, like not just talking about the problems, but presenting solutions, right? And kind of breaking down the barriers of what you think is inconceivable you know you look you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take you know when you can when you can connect with people through so many different ways like that's what gives you the leg up you know like chris was saying up here earlier like the power is in the people right 
all the financial engineering that's done by mega corporations, all the money that they think they make, like workers produce the base capital. And that's why they get so scared when people talk to each other, right? When they form those bonds, because they're like, holy shit, these motherfuckers go and figure that shit out. Like there goes, there goes our, you know, second house, there goes our third Mercedes, right? And, and again, is this just, it's keeping up at it every single day, you know I mean? For like our organizing drive, for instance, like there was only one week where I didn't get signatures and it was to kind of like try and cool things down. But right, like there are those times where like in the beginning you get 20 signatures in a day and then like you may have a day where you only get like one or two, you know, and most of the people are like, oh, here comes this fucking guy again talking about organizing. Like I'm tired of it. Like I'm tired of this place. But right, it's it's that it's that battle of attrition. Like one of the things that you know I'm really into that that helped a lot with it is is boxing, right? You, you're an inside fighter, like you're in it for that battle of attrition, you know, you're duking it out. You're like, yo, we're here, we're with it, you know? And, and again, like that's, that's organizing, that's showing up every day and that's understanding what your goal is, what your vision is and trying to share that with others because it's like, look, like there is a better world out there. There is something better. And it starts again, just by taking the time to give a shit. And it's like, that's like, it's, Right. That's, I guess, probably one of the best things to say to kind of break down the complexity of it. That is the difference between, you know, Ted Decker, the CEO of Home Depot, Tim Horgan, the executive vice president, you know, uh, our, our regional vice president who walks around thinking that, you know, he gives a shit about people trying to act like it right work and people like that's the difference between the people on this stage, the people in this room and those individuals is that when we say that we give a shit about people, you know, I can go and I can tell you about, you know, Carmenia Torres is, you know, three kids and how she moved here from DR. I can tell you about my boy Ray, who grew up in Baltimore, moved up here. My homie George, who came from San Jose, my work grandpa, right? You know, everybody up here has got those people that they can connect with. And, and that's what it's about at the end of the day is it's developing those relationships that are naturally going to occur within the workplace and then continuing to build on that and helping people to see within themselves what you see in them what they may not see in themselves and what the executive sure as shit don't want, want people to see in themselves, so. So when it comes to uh, Local 79 or construction trades organizing, um, our organizing doesn't really look like traditional union organizing. And there's several reasons for that. Um, construction is just such a unique industry um, in terms of our work, right? It can, our work tends to be project to project on a job to job basis. We work to complete the projects that we're working on. So that means we're working to put ourselves out of a job. Um, some other industries might be able to relate. And we have a very transient workforce. You know, um, workers are moving around from site to site, might be uh, split up into different crews, geographically dispersed. So the, you know, NLRB um, vote strategy doesn't really land the same way that it does in other industries and workplaces. So if you've ever gone around the city and you've seen the big inflatable rat on a pickup truck and some people wearing hard hats or, you know, union gear outside, that's probably Local 79 or another union, but it's probably mostly Local 79. Um, that's us. We're out there. You know, we have those. Those are called our informational lines, also called job site actions, where we're out educating workers and the public about, well, we're educating the workers about their rights. We're educating them about, you know, the laws that exist to help them to keep them safe that nobody teaches us about and that their bosses are invested in them not knowing about. Um, we're educating the public about the risks that non-union construction projects can pose to themselves, their communities. Um, it's you know not unheard of to be walking down um, a sidewalk in Manhattan and a, a sidewalk shed or a scaffold collapses and hurts someone. You know these are things that are in the news every now and then, and they they really catch your attention. Um, I'm trying to think of more examples. So I'm, I'm going to jump to the most extreme example. Last year in New York City, 22 construction workers died and 17 were on non-union job sites. And that's something, you know, if we're not out there doing what we're doing, that's a dynamic that's only going to grow. So we have to deal with that, but we can't just do it on a job site to job site basis. We can't have a rat up at every single construction site in New York City. So that's where we need to think structurally, and that's where we do think structurally. So what we do as Local 79, um, we fight to feed in our street game, our ground game, our organizing campaigns on the job sites into, a large, into bigger picture battles that really create the changes that we need to impact our industry. 
So, for example, um, we're fighting alongside the Fund Excluded Workers Coalition, which includes um, immigrant organizations, worker centers like uh, New Immigrant Community Empowerment, Make the Road, and many others, um, in order to fight for what's now being called the Unemployment Bridge Program, to create a permanent system of unemployment benefits for excluded workers who could be, um, you know, formerly incarcerated people coming out, um, immigrants that can't receive unemployment benefits because we believe that if there's a safety net for these workers, it'll be easier for them to be able to stand up to their, bo to their bosses and organize and organize with their coworkers versus if you have to choose between, shit, do I talk to my coworkers about possibly we get together and address um, these unsafe conditions or the wages that we're making? Do I choose between that or hunger? If we take that out of the equation through something like the unemployment benefits program, then we, you know, we've significantly changed the game. Um, some other things that we've done, we, a couple of years ago in 2021, we passed this thing called the body shop bill in city council. Um, body shops are a notorious thing in New York City in our construction industry. Think of a plantation packed into an LLC. Body shops are where when developers and contractors not only don't want to hire union workers, when they want to exploit the shit out of workers to put up their projects and make a killing off of it economically, they go to you know body shop um, business bro body shop labor brokers who provide them with vulnerable workers from vulnerable communities, formerly incarcerated people, immigrants, just like I mentioned before, and everybody in that pecking order is making a profit from the labor of these workers who are going, who are making poverty wages, don't have benefits, and have things being held over their head, like the possibility of deportation or returning to prison. So we passed the bill that forces these companies to license, to register and get licensed by the city and come out of the shadows, so to speak, as well as provide information about their, um, the wages that they're paying their workers. And that's a huge step towards, you know, not only getting more information on them so we can, you know, go after them as organizers um, and our organizing departments, but also to show the non-union workers, hey, look, like it's possible to build power. We just made your boss have to come out of the shadows. You can go on the city website and I can show you how to look up the wages that they're paying you. Um, it, it, it's an empowering thing to be able to show workers tangible results. Um, other tangible results that we got were passing some criminal justice reforms in 2021 at the state level. So because of the legislation that we passed then, it's now no longer um, a parole violation to work overtime in New York. Think about how crazy it is that before a couple of years ago, if you're on parole and you're trying to work overtime, that's a parole violation, or attending a labor demonstration, that's a parole violation. So if you need to make a few extra hours a week in order to keep a roof over your head, you got to choose between that and going, being thrown back into prison. Um, I have a union brother sitting in the crowd who worked on a job once, a union job site, where um, an apprentice who was on parole had to bring their probation officer in in order to try and convince them to let them work overtime. And when that fellow came to the job site, the entire crew, which I believe was like 50 people, they mobbed up on him and said, what are you doing? Let him work overtime, blah, blah, blah. They convinced him on the spot when he saw you know, the shop steward, the coworkers, the foreman, everybody vouching for this person. And that's what union solidarity is about. And the, the man was allowed to work overtime after that. So we took you know, that solidarity, that strength that we display on our job sites that keeps us strong in the industry. And we raised it to the level of law in order to change at a widespread scale people's lives that work in this industry. So we try to, you know, when, when we're going after companies like Alba, when we're going after um, body shops and organizing the workers, the workers that get organized in through our union apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs, you know, they become some of the fiercest advocates and activists you've ever seen. And their stories that they bring to the table and the facts that they bring to the light are really able to move um, things at the level of politicians and policymakers, elected officials, who have the power to allocate, either allocate or don't, the resources to these companies that are getting significant public subsidies in order to exploit workers all over New York City. Um, so our organizing, you know, it's, it, it, there's a macro level to it, there's a micro level to it, but every step of the way, at every rung of the ladder, the most important thing is the stories 
of the workers, their lives, their communities, their history, how they got to where they were, and how the union changed their lives. Because there is an endless amount of stories. And if you want to look them up, you can actually um, follow Laborers Fight Back on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And we have so many graphics with so many workers who talk about the experience of becoming union workers and how that changed their lives, but also the darkness that they had to face in the non-union side of the field. Um, and this is what's generating massive profits for developers and banks and hedge funds all over, you know, down in Wall Street. Um, and it shouldn't be that the rich just keep on getting richer while sucking all of the wealth out of our communities and while workers are literally falling out of buildings and dying. Oh yeah, and yeah, Sarah Beth, Riley, what does is, what is the organizing look like in your respective corners of the world? Similarly, <laughs> it's a lot about stories. It's a lot about meeting people where they're at, hearing what their concerns are, hearing what their worries are, talking about their families, talking about uh, what it feels like to have a sick kid and to have to yourself call in and then get scolded for it or written up, face disciplinary action, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that most of our conversations have to do with either fear or possibility or a combination of both. And so having really honest conversations about people's fears, about what am I afraid of uh, if we walk out? What am I afraid of if we go to the bargaining table and we're sitting across from somebody who has complete control over our collective future? What, what, is that, what does that fear feel like and how can we move through that with a sense of possibility? And I think that's where uh, it becomes really, really, really essential uh, to talk to folks um, and ask them uh, when they're afraid, where that fear is coming from, what evidence they have for that fear, and then having a conversation about what evidence we may or may not have to counteract that fear. And st sometimes just telling folks that you have to sit with the fear and it will be fine if we do it together. And over and over and over having those conversations, having, you know, uh, before we had a walkout um, on New Year's Eve in Minneapolis and before that walkout, we were on the phone for hours with people talking about what they were afraid of. Were they afraid of uh, a relationship with a manager being damaged? Were they afraid for their job secu security? And how can we together uh, move through that? And so I think that that is ultimately um, fear, possibility, and then again, what, what you guys are saying, just collecting stories, talking to folks, building community, building relationships with people, because we spend so much time together. It is most, if you're working 40 hours a week, that's most of your hours. These are micro communities that are just your whole life. And so they have to feel safe. They have to feel protected. They have to feel like you can invest in them uh, and that the people around you have your back. So I'm sure many of you have heard about the anti-union propaganda coming from Starbucks corporate. So if I'm simplifying um, organizing in a Starbucks cafe environment, it's kind of a two-step process. The first being defacing the rhetoric coming from corporate. Because um, we are faced all the time with false information about Workers United. Personally, I when I was organizing my store in Baltimore and getting ready to transfer here to New York for school, I was told, well, Riley, if you unionize, you're not going to be able to get that transfer. You're not going to be able to go to work in a store in New York. Not true. Um, so, so many things like that that first have to be... Um, People need to know that they don't have your best interest at heart. They want money. Um, so my first step is to make that clear to my coworkers that this propaganda coming from your bosses is false. They don't have your best interest. Um, and then the second step being, of course, pretty similar to what everyone has said here, uh, human connection. 
Um, you spend, like you said, we spend so much time together. You, our coworkers build this connection and care for one another that is so valuable when organizing because sympathy and anger are the two most important emotions when it comes to organization. Um, I always say this to people when they, to fellow partners when they talk to me about organization, get your coworkers angry. Start thinking about scheduling. Start thinking about your hour cuts, which are ridiculous. Um, start thinking about all of these things that you are not treated fairly and get mad because it's not fair. And that anger is so motivating to bring people together. So you get angry and then you connect with each other and sympathize with one another. And that is the best way to build a sense of community and start building your union. Hell yeah. So <clears throat> we're, we're going to uh, get to Q&A in a sec, but I want to just kind of like do a quick um, final round here. And I'm just warning you guys that we're going to go in reverse snake order. So in a second, I'm going to throw it back to y'all and then we'll come back this way. Um, but I guess like before we open up to q and I want to build on this incredible conversation, which I'm truly honored to have with you all and think about um, what sorts of actionable lessons we can give people from the incredible struggles um, that y'all have been involved in, that Starbucks workers around the country have been involved in, and, and also, you know, our other brothers, sisters, and siblings, you know, fighting the fight across the country and beyond. Like, what can we learn from the past one, two, three years, right, that can make us better organizers, that can help us build more robust power uh, with longer staying power, um, what lessons have you learned that you find now you're applying to organizing that are cutting down a lot of the lag time that maybe you faced in the beginning? Anything like that. It could be social media strategy, conversational strategy, could be using great tools like Action Builder, right, to cut down on like keeping track of all the workers you've talked to in your shop, right, <laughs> instead of using a, a fucking Google spreadsheet or something like that. And I just wanted to sort of like give an example from the, the the media side, from the supporter side, um, you know, folks who are listening to this can't see it, but I am wearing um, my UMWA shirt, uh, which was given to me by the great Braxton Wright, who himself uh, has been on strike in Alabama at Warrior Met Coal for 23 months, right? Nearly two years. I think it's now the longest strike in Alabama state history. Who here has heard of it? Okay. The lesson that I think we all need to sit with this week, because if folks haven't heard the news, the UMWA has sent a letter to Warrior Met after 23 months of strike, unconditionally saying workers are going to go back to work or offering workers go back to work while negotiations can continue. But obviously we know like that this is not the way we wanted the strike to end. And Warrior Met is already saying that there are 41 workers that they're not going to let get their jobs back um, because of their quote unquote conduct during the strike, which is horseshit. But what I think we need to learn from this struggle is we can't forget about each other, right? These workers were holding the line for nearly two years while national media ignored them, while politicians on the Democratic side and the Republican side abandoned them. And while we, I think, with the best of intentions, would support these workers down in Alabama when we could, when we remembered to, when we saw a post on social media, but what happened in the long stretches in between that, the weeks, the months, when the holidays were around, right? That's the stuff that chips away at you. That's what makes it harder to hold the line when that's what we need workers to do. That's what they need to do for themselves and their families. We can't just get excited when we see a new Starbucks store has filed to unionize and forget about the workers who just unionized and are now having their hours cut below 20 hours a week and they're losing their goddamn health care. Or when Starbucks just closes unionized stores like in Seattle or Ithaca or anywhere, where are we when that happens? Right? I think one of the lessons that what I'm trying to say is that we all also have a role to play here. We can keep that fire burning. We can show up for each other 
in our respective locales. If there's a strike going on in your area, get your ass to that picket line. Donate to that strike fund. Or if you can't, share it with people who can. Right? Just keep that story alive. Keep the struggle alive however you can. As we say all the time on this podcast and at The Real News, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And so I hope that, you know, we are all send, I know we're all sending our love and solidarity to everyone down in Brookwood right now. Um, after two, nearly two years of intense struggle at Warrior Met Cole, we can't forget about them. We can't forget about any of our siblings out there who, you know, are still fighting that good fight. So with that in mind, let's kind of do a, a sort of quick round around the table, starting with Ryland coming back here. Uh, I guess what other sorts of lessons from the past year or so of struggle do you think folks, you want folks to leave this conversation with? Um, what I want people to leave this conversation with is that we are people. The people who make your coffee in the morning are people. We have feelings, we have emotions, we have lives, we have families. Because every day that I clock into work, I have I could, hundreds of customers not treating us like human beings. So the best way you can so, show solidarity to your baristas is a smile. Um, how are you? How's your family doing? Any kind of connection, How even asking about how we're doing in our union fight. Just a little bit of humanity is all we need to really feel that support. Um, from people. And as for my fellow partners, what I suggest during these times in between actions is one, keep these conversations with your coworkers going about, especially right now with Starbucks, we are facing aggressive hour cuts, um, specifically in New York City, um, that is extremely illegal because of the Fair Work Week Act. Fair Week Work Week Act states that you cannot have over a 15% cut in hours without just cause. I know people who were cut 50% of their hours. Um, so keep these conversations going, keep that anger flowing, because that's how the momentum is going to keep going. I think, again, going back to possibility, you can do it. Uh, I didn't know what a union was, and we figured it out, and we figured it out together. And so for those folks who are feeling just incredibly frustrated, feeling worn down, and feeling like their workplace is just an awful place to be and to exist in, you can do it. And you can figure it out using the resources that are widely available. Social media is amazing in, in uh, connecting us and bringing us together and, and people in your community. The communities uh, that were in the Minneapolis labor community has been absolutely instrumental in, in helping us out and giving us advice and just talking to us. Again, when, when we were at the very beginning and knew absolutely nothing. And so again, I would say you can do it. <laughs> So the point that I've been trying to drive home, and I hope I've been doing an okay job of it, is that the relationships between labor and capital, between employers and employees in the construction industry, reflect the relationships between our communities and the people in power and you know wealth and power. Um, and it's an exploitative and a, an impressive relationship. And you know the powers that be depend on that setup remaining that way in order to have a a pool of cheap labor to draw from to put up these buildings that construction workers build um, every day. So one of the things happening in New York City right now is that there's a severe housing crisis. You know, nobody is happy with the rents. If you are, God bless you. But there's, you know, a housing shortage and other dynamics um, that are driving the rents up. So the government is really being compelled to act. And what they want to do is pump out as many apartments as possible over the next decade to the tune of 500,000 apartments. Now, those don't just you know fall out of the sky and, and drop into the ground. They have to be built. Um, these are you know large residential developments. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of construction work. So the way that we're looking at it is that this, this is where a lot of the investment and the construction boom is moving towards to solve the housing crisis. 
and alleviating the pressure on the housing supply constraints right now. Um, that development boom can either increase and deepen generational poverty and disenfranchisement and criminalization for working class black and brown communities, or it can be a means of building generational wealth and uplifting people and creating means of economic mobility. And the way to do that, in our view, is what we're calling the fight for construction justice. And the fight for construction justice is a fight for strong local higher policies to actually create you know, pathways for people from our communities who have traditionally been excluded from um, the construction industry and even unions at one point to gain these careers, but not just to have a job, but to have a good job. So we're also fighting for a wage floor, a wage standard with these local higher policies. We believe that construction workers working on city financed housing developments, which like I just said, they, they are planning on 500,000 over a decade. It's a lot of work. If you go and see a big you know, residential building, chances are it's like 1,000 apartments or less. So 500,000, way bigger number. Um, if our taxpayer dollars are going into funding this, then we should be able to pay construction workers at least $40 an hour with medical and retirement benefits added into that. So that's our vision right now. It's a campaign that we're launching. Um, what I would ask in terms of actionable items, you know, go and help us with this. Spread the message. Follow Laborers Fight Back. Follow Laborers 79. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. TikTok, I think we're still figuring out. But, um, you know, spread our message. Help us get it out there. If you are an organization in New York City, you know, we'd love to have co-sponsors on the construction justice movement and join our coalition and help us spread the movement. You know, um, Local 79 is known as a union that goes out and fights alongside everybody. You know, we've been out there with Amazon, we've marched with Starbucks, um, so many different causes, so many different people. And, you know, now we're putting out the call. We need help to fight for our communities, to fight for our industry and make sure that, you know, workers' justice and workers' power means something real in the construction industry. So laborers fight back, everybody. I was gonna say, if you need help with TikTok, you should talk to this guy real quick. So I'm still, I'm still getting that figured out. But uh, if you guys ever want to check out a, a long-winded 10-minute monologue, <laughs> you can go check it out. Um, all right, so I kind of want to hit this question from two points. Um, the first one is kind of just more the nuts and bolts of organizing. Um, firstly, I'll say, look, our organizing campaign did not end the way that we wanted. It ended actually very poorly. It was uh, 165 to 51. It was a heavy burden to carry. We also lost the World Series that night, so that was, that was not a good night. Um, but you know, something that I learned in that, right? Be careful being really gung-ho. You know, I was very determined, I was very driven, and I, you know, ended up taking on a lot of the work. Um, it was about myself and three other organizers, and I was doing the vast majority of it. And right in the, in the time that you're going through it, you're, you're animated, you're, yeah, we're gonna do this, we're gonna take this, we're gonna beat these motherfuckers up, like, yeah, come on, let's go, let's do this. But the problem is, over time, right, it's tiring. You're working a 40-hour job, you're doing all this shit trying to organize, trying to do interviews. I got a two-year-old at home, you know, it's trying to, like, balance all that stuff out. It's very, very difficult, and so, you know, what I, what I tell myself now, right, not that we wanna take stuff back, because you either win or you learn. You know, it's like my quarterback, Jalen Hurts said, I gotta shout out the Eagles. Um, but you know, you either win or you learn. And something that, something that I learned from that was the importance of, again, right, to the previous answer we gave on connection, making sure that that connection is established and sharing that burden, right? Um, you know, definitely being organized where you can bring in like Action Builder. I wish that that was something that I had familiarized myself more with because it would have made things a lot easier. Um, but like the, the second part of it that I wanna get into is, is kind of like, right, like, I think of it like this, like if I were to talk to myself before I got into organizing, you know, I was, I was really frustrated in life. Um, I felt like I had a lot of things going for me, but yet the opportunities that I wanted just weren't presenting themselves. Um, I would look around at my coworkers and I would, I would feel angry and I would feel frustrated, like why are things not changing? And, and in that, what I would encourage people to do, people who are considering organizing, you know, one of the first things you wanna work on is what you can within yourself you know, and to kind of rectify and to correct those things. And it's, it's difficult, right? That's kind of like an ambiguous answer. But the thing is like, you, you really have to know yourself. You really have to know who you are. You have to understand your position in life, understand what the world needs from you. And if you feel that calling, if you feel that in your belly, 
act on it, right? Something Max and I talked about in the interview that we just recently did. Um, and, it, and it's honestly some like, look, I'm gonna sound like a complete fucking dork, but I don't really care. I watched like The Matrix a thousand times. I watched Batman a bunch of times. I watched Spider-Man a bunch of times, right? Because in all honesty, like when you look at it, like right now, like I'm sitting next to real world fucking superheroes, right? You know, like nobody's gonna come and the, there's not a spider that's gonna fucking bite you. You know, you're not gonna be the orphan of billionaire parents, but you know, there are these concepts that we love in these movies, right? Of, of overcoming obstacles, of, you know, fighting for your fellow man, things that are so powerful. And if there was ever an opportunity that I saw to do that, you know, that's why I love when Eddie challenged me because I, I fucking went home that night and I watched The Matrix and I'm like, bitch, I'm gonna be Neo. <laughs> you know, like, you know and, and it's a great opportunity to like live those values, to live those things and, you know, you never know what's going to happen if you don't take that step, you know? You can find a thousand and one reasons to not do something, you know? Or, conversely, you can find a thousand and one reasons to do something, you know? And in the end, that's, that's what organizing is, you know? That's what these, these, you know, people on the panel have been talking about is, you know, not just sitting there frustrated, but doing something, you know? So what I would tell people in those times where they're frustrated in work, where they're you know, like some long-haired asshole that was sitting back and receiving it in a Home Depot in Philadelphia who was just mad all the time. Like, yo, know, like this is your opportunity to be great. You know, greatness doesn't always come about like in the ways that we think, but greatness is greatness, you know? And what the people in this room are doing, you know, what the people I'm sitting next to are doing, it's greatness and it's your opportunity to be great and leave an impact on, on the world around you, on your community. And if that's not inspiration enough to, to get off your ass and do something like, I don't know what is, man. So, look, let's all go out there. Let's be Batman. Let's be Wonder Woman. Let's be Superman. Let's be Neo. Let's be, you know, let's be the heroes in our community who can make things better because it's through people like the ones in this room and the things that we do that can help us to make that difference. So ain't nobody coming to save us. So it's time to save ourselves. Let's give it up for our great panel, everyone. All right, so I'm fired up, but uh, and we ran a little long, but I apologize. I didn't want to stop that conversation ever. But uh, I know that that folks have some some questions, so I wanted to see with the time we have left if folks had any questions they wanted to ask our amazing panelists. Uh, the great Mariah over there has a microphone. Again, we are recording this, so please speak into the mic so we can get you on the recording. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Bryant. Uh, I work with Amnesty International. I just want to say thank you so much. Y'all are really real life superheroes. I mean, you guys are powerful. Um, the gentleman from Local 79 said uh, that you guys are out, the union's out there saving lives and changing lives, and I could not agree more. Um, so, my question is Is there a story or an instance in your organizing work? where you've been like struggling, going through it, you come home, you're exhausted, and you just encounter a situation at the workplace, like a colleague that like really made, like anchored yourself in this work, where you're like, okay, I can't give up because other people depend on me to do this work. And I'm wondering if one of you or all of you could speak to that. Thank you. And we can, we can load up on like, does, is there another question folks want to throw in there? And then the panel can jump in with whichever one they want to address. Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Megan. I'm with the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee. It's been really awesome. Um, I have uh, two questions that are interconnected, so hope you bear with me. My first question is just like, how do you guys start having an organizing conversation with someone that you don't know where they stand yet? Like, how, like what does that conversation look like, and how do you start to kind of feel someone out who you don't yet know? And then the second part of that is, how do you bring people in who you know are down with the union to help you have those sorts of conversations? Thanks. And just, I just want to make sure on this side, did anyone have a question? Just want to make sure I didn't neglect that side. Okay, and then here's our last one. Uh, I'm Robert, I'm an 1199 organizer. In terms of Starbucks, I hear a lot that we should go and say like Union Yes is our name. 
And that feels to me like a really great way to just like blow up a campaign if I don't know that people are already organizing and have inoculated against management. And so is that something you, you actually want people to do or to like not do if they haven't sussed out the landscape already? I'm just gonna go ahead and answer that question super quickly. Um, personally, I don't think it's the best thing to do. It just, yeah, you're showing your solidarity, but it's in the long run, you're not really doing anything to help the campaign by ordering with the name Union Yes. Um, it was nice when we won our union election that we had a bunch of people congratulating us via their mobile orders. But if you aren't sure of where a store stands in their organization process, I wouldn't. But thank you for that question, it's really important. And as far as the other ones, whoever wants to jump in, if you got, got if you got that fire in your belly, like like Vince said, and you got a response, hop in. Oh yeah. Um, so to the first gentleman's question, um, I actually right. So I have like a little like a little inspiration folder at home, um, and one of the things that I have in there is like very special to the point that he was talking about. And so I had like a really really hard day. A lot of people tell me no. Um, it was a rainy day. So I go out to my car, I'm getting ready to leave, and I see something on my car. So, you know, normally people like to walk through the parking lot and leave shit on there. So I'm over here thinking, ah, oh, some fucking asshole left me some shit that I don't want to buy. So I go, and for whatever reason, I was just compelled to look at it. And I look, and it's a fucking note that says, pro union, you go, brother. And I'm like, holy fuck, somebody took the time to figure out my fucking car and go and put this shit on there. <laughs> And I tell you, like, when my mood was like that and it just shot straight up, I was like, man, that that was that was such an amazing feeling just because, again, is it's like the smallest thing. Somebody leaving a note on your car and go, I, like I said, I still right next to the 165 to 51 paper. I have a tattered paper that says pro union. You go, brother. And when somebody talks to me in 60 years, I'll probably still have that shit because that's just that was a cool reminder of how awesome people can be. Um, and then just real quick to, to Megan's question, I kind of forget the second half, but at least wanted to answer the first half. Um, honestly, I think just like engaging with people, just like, yo, how do you feel about your work environment, right? And like a lot of people like at first would kind of be like, what's this dude getting at? And it's like, look, like I think the pay sucks. Like I think the scheduling sucks. And then that kind of like opened people up more. Oh, and then she said, like, how do you bring people into having that conversation? Um, you could like, right, you're gonna have like your peoples who like you're like, you guys are on the same page, like everything is kind of just rolling. And so like from there, you kind of just build off of it. Like you you really just approach it with like an open mind. Like even the people who you know, like I talked to people who I knew weren't like pro-union, but I was like, yo, look, like there's a benefit to talking to people to get them on the same side, but there's also a benefit to figuring out why people don't want to unionize. And at the end of the day, like if you approach it with that mindset, you're already better than the company you're fighting against because you're just actually trying to understand the landscape as opposed to like trying to force feed your perspective. And to build on to that, uh, one of my favorite methods of talking to my coworkers is if someone's complaining about something, um, kind of jump in there and be like, so you think that you're having a hard time because we're understaffed? Well, <laughs> the union is actually working to fix that. Um, so it's just when people are upset, that's a really great time to kind of insert yourself. Um, but if you're not getting to that point, the best way is to just start bringing up issues, in my opinion. Start bringing up issues you're having. See if other people are having those issues. Um, and then slowly start bringing, it's best to start slow when you're talking about um, unionization, especially when you don't know someone's opinion at first. Um, start talking about issues like, oh, what do you think about um, the new schedule coming out? Your hours have been cut, like that's crazy. Um, and then start slowly mentioning um, your union, Workers United, whatever you're working with. Um, and it's a great way to facilitate that conversation. Um, on my end, when you're having a conversation with construction workers, um, and this is a lesson that I have to relearn over and over again, um, or any workers really, patience is the most important thing. Um, you have to, like I keep saying, you have to be able to really listen. You have to be able to pay attention to details, what people are saying. You know, sometimes people are telling you things without even knowing they're telling you things. And a skilled organizer has to be able to pick up on all of that. Um, the other side of it is, when you're talking to people or trying to get them to act, you know, you have to walk people through the contradictions in their own head. 
and you have to walk them through certain things so that they come to realize it on their own. Um, and that just requires such a level of patience. But once you get people there, you know, once you've taken them to a place where they've never been before, you got them and then they got themselves and they can get other people, you know, into that space of freedom in their mind. And that only builds on itself. I think when it comes to, um, you know, strategic methods and stuff for when you're dealing with people in any job site, um, there, there's an OG organizer that might be in um, some of the bookshelves here, but there's a saying that I've gone by since, you know, I was an organizer in my younger days. Wherever you go, you got to find people and understand that people generally will fall into three categories. The more advanced, you know, the people that might be more aware or more inclined to action already. Um, the intermediate, the people in the middle that might not ever get involved but might not stand in your way. Or, and, and then the people that are waiting to be won over. And that's, you know, where most people will fall. And then the backwards, you know, the stubborn, reactionary types that will try to obstruct you. They might be the snitch on the job, be the ones to go running to the boss, be the rat, whatever. You have to be able to identify where people fall. And the way I've always thought about it is you got to unite the advanced to win over the intermediate and isolate the backwards. And in all my years of organizing, um, that's never failed. And as for uh, what I think was the first question, um, when it comes to how hard organizing can be, because nothing ever goes right, you know, nothing ever goes according to plan. You have to improvise. Um, every day I wake up, I don't know what my day is going to look like. Um, whatever I had planned for the week, those plans are gone by the end of the day. You know, it's, it's that kind of lifestyle, at least in construction. Um, I don't wish that on anyone in other, any other industry, but that really is where um, camaraderie and solidarity, those things really do matter. You know, like my people are sitting in the crowd right over here and small fraction of my union family, but shout out to Local 79. But um, those things really do matter. And that's where you constantly have to be building a sense of community and what you're doing. And you know, that involves a lot of things. That involves um, accountability, that involves, uh, principles, being principled, you know, all the things that it takes to hold groups together. And the larger that groups get, the more complex they get, the more that divisions grow. So I think, um, you know, kind of want to bring it back to what Chris said in the beginning up here. You have to be able to work with people that don't see things the way that you do, that have different beliefs, that have opposite beliefs. You can only imagine I work in construction. Um, there's a lot of conservative folks I work with that, you know, vote for Trump or whatever and have those worldviews. And these are the people that I have to be able to reliably be able to fight side by side against some of the richest people on this planet. And, you know, there are people that I've met who I have completely opposite worldviews from who I would rather get into battle with and some people that I have the same exact worldviews on. And when you're able to hit that balance, you know, that's the crucial thing that a, that a working class organizer needs to be able to do. Because there is no, there is no universe, no timeline where a working class organizer is able to successfully organize labor movements with homogenousness. You have to be able to work with people who see things differently. To answer Megan's question, I think that uh, looking at your conversations with your coworkers as just mostly about life and then a little bit about the union uh, feels very, very, very helpful, especially in the beginning. But continuing on, um, some of those questions are, are that you can ask about somebody's life uh, really relate to how they feel about organized labor, how they feel about their workplace. What do you think about this manager? What do you think about that manager? Uh, where did you work before? What was that like? What are the things you liked about that environment? Uh, have you had any, like, tell me a crazy story about um, any, like, did you work in the restaurant industry? Like, was it bonkers? How did that feel? Um, and asking about people's families. A lot of people have parents who were in unions, have you know, relatives who are union stewards or presidents of a local. And so really mapping, trying to create a 360 view very gently uh, over hopefully a longer period of time if you want to do some deep organizing, right? Um, but again, trying to understand the whole picture versus just uh, a little part of it. 
All right, gang. Well, it is eight o'clock. I want to ask everyone to give our panel one more round of applause. I want to thank you all once again for coming out, especially with the crappy weather. We really appreciate it. This was a really special conversation, and I would encourage you all to keep the conversation going, right? After this, come up and meet our incredible panel of superheroes. Tell us about the work that you're doing in your community. Let's do more of these events. Reach out to us at The Real News. We will cover as much as we possibly can. The point, again, is that we all have a role to play in this. We can all help change the world. So let's go out there and do it. Thank you to the People's Forum. Thank you to Action Builder. Thank you to all of you. Good night. Thank you to Chris Smalls. Hi, everyone. Just really quick, thank you all for coming out to our Build Power event. I do want to shout out the Action Network Action Builder team. Um, and then just a couple of quick announcements. If you haven't got a chance to sign in and check in and let us know that you're here, there's QR codes on the wall. Just scan it. Just check in so that we know that you've been here. If you have a drink ticket, we did not forget about you. There's still drinks available. Please go get those. And if you never, if you haven't received one, Valeria right here in a really cool green jumpsuit can provide you with a ticket. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.